there is none like you no one else can touch my heart like you do I can search for all eternity long and find there is none like you would you sing it with me this morning there is none like you no one else no one else can touch my heart like you do i can search for all eternity long and find there is none like would you sing it from your heart this morning there is none there is none like you no one else can touch my heart like you do and i can search for all eternity long and find there is none like you come on i can search and i can search for all eternity long and find there is none like you believe it or not we're coming to the end of another year more than that we're coming to the end of another decade and for some of us it couldn't leave soon enough right there's some of us is all right is that is that <laughs> get out of here <laughs> and take all your bags with you because the the 2010s in the 2010s you may have faced a lot of hardship you may have been left with a lot more questions than you were answers maybe the doctor said some things about you and to you that you never thought that he or she would say about you or to you maybe your life took some twists and some turns that you weren't expecting and you're thinking to yourself bring on the new decade <laughs> bring on the new me right Amen. you thought it would be different you thought your 2019 would be different than your 2018 was supposed to be different than your 2017 and so on and so forth maybe the last year and the last decade for you was kind of amazing and you kind of hate to see it go you may be holding on to your past maybe feeling a little anxious of what the new year might bring because there are some things coming in the new year that are going to be completely out of our control and that's why for the believer it's so important for us to not put our hope into the things of this world Amen. to not put our hope and our trust into the things that are that are here one year and gone the next but to put our hope into the everlasting God Amen. to put our hope into the one the, the God who is the same yesterday today and forever you see our faith will only be as strong as what it's resting in I want us to, as we're coming to the end of a year, coming to the end of a, of a decade, we're going into a new one. I want us to realize that, that what our faith is resting in matters. What are you, what is your faith resting in? Like when you go to, go to sleep at night, you're not sleeping on a rock, right? But I'm, I'm pretty sure you have a, have a pillow. It's soft. But realize the same thing with your faith. What is your faith resting on is it something hard and jagged something that's sharp or is it in the everlasting god because our faith will only be as strong as what it's resting in you see we can't expect our faith to move mountains if our faith is resting in something that is temporary if our faith is resting in something that is already broken in Psalm the 145th chapter, the psalmist says there, your kingdom, God, 
is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. It's a kingdom that is not an earthly kingdom. It's a kingdom that's not a temporary kingdom, but it's a kingdom that is everlasting, that is going to go through, throughout all generations. This is a kingdom that has, has existed before you and I came to exist. And after we cease to exist here on this planet, his kingdom will continue. In 1 Timothy, the, fir the first chapter, the 17th verse, Paul is writing to his understudy, Timothy. And he writes these words to Timothy and he says, to the king of the ages or to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory, how long? Forever and ever, amen. We see the words of Jesus recorded in John, the fourth chapter, the 14th verse, as, as Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman at the well. Uh, Jesus asked the woman for a drink, and then he, he gets into a discussion with her, and he says, you know, the water that you're drinking from, you're going to have to come back to this well every single day, because th this water is going to leave you thirsty. You're going to have to come back. He says, but he says, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. Speaking of the Holy Spirit, that when a believer puts their faith and their trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within the child of God. He says, the water that I will give him will become in, in him. Where? In him, a spring of water welling up to what? Eternal life. Because his life on this planet is going to come to an end. And for the child of God who has put their faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is dwelling within them, marking them as, as a child of God. When they breathe their last breath, because of the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them, when they take their last breath, they're going to well up to eternal life. And no matter what your years have looked like, and no matter what the new decade has to bring, just remember that there is still a God who is faithful. There is still a God who is for you, who loves you, who is, who is with you. And it may not have turned out the way that you have hoped or the way that you had expected. But remember the words of Jesus in John 16, he said these words, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. Amen. Not in the things that you accumulate, not in, the, not in the relationships that we have because we know relationships come and go. We know that relationships are up and down. We know that the things that we're reaching for, we're scratching for, we're trying to, to uh, just pile up in our own lives, they come and go. And when, we, when, when it's all said and done, when we take our last breath, it's left to whoever wants it, whoever who wants to fight for it more. But Jesus says that in me, you may have peace. He says in the world, you will have tribulation. So Jesus is prophesying. He's telling the future. He's letting us know today in 2019 that the world is going to bring tribulation, that just living in this world, we're going to have tribulation. But he says, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Amen. You have nothing to worry about, honey. Amen. Jesus says, I have overcome the world. You know, as a church, at the first of the year, we come together as a body, as the body of Christ, to give God our first, to give God our best. We start the year with a 21-day fast. And I want you to know that it's not something that's required it's not something that's mandatory. No one's going to look at you weird if you don't. But for those that do, I truly believe that God has something set aside special for you on the other side of this sacrifice and on the other side of this surrender. I truly believe it with all my heart. And I want to share a message with you today that I'm calling Awakening. Can I hear someone say Awakening? awakening. Because I believe that when a person comes to know Christ and they develop a relationship with Jesus, that it's, it's, not, it's not just a merely opening of your eyes, but it's, it's like we were once walking in darkness, but now we're walking in the light. 
We, we were once dead in our sin, but now we are alive. We've been resurrected. And so it's not nearly, it's not just, just merely a, 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 an opening of our eyes, but it's internal into where we are now. We're woke. Look at your neighbor and say, we're a woke church. And so before we get into the word this morning, let's start off with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much. I pray this morning that, that we would have the courage, the confidence, and the strength to, to open up our hearts. That we wouldn't put our trust in a man, we wouldn't put our trust in a church, but we would put our trust in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who gave his life so that we could live. Who gave his life so that we could be put in, in right standing with, with God the Father. And Lord, I pray that in this word that we would be changed, that we would, we would come to know you more. And that it wouldn't be just merely an experience, it wouldn't be just a, a time of, 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 good, of a good word, but that it would change us from the inside out because we were in the presence of a holy God. Lord, change our hearts and we'll give you the thanks in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen. So if you'd like more information about fasting, about the basics of fasting. We've set it up on our website. This would be a horrible time to do that, just to let you know. Don't go to the website now, but I'm letting you know so that later on this week, you can go check out um, some of the basics um, about fasting. Um, and also, it's gonna be updated later on this week, hopefully earlier in the week, about the Daniel fast. That's the, the fast that, that I'm gonna be on, that I'm gonna be doing. Um, and and it's, it, in essence, the Daniel fast is abstaining from, some, from um, meats and sweets. And so you'll be surprised what kind of a sacrifice you'll be, you'll be uh, stepping into when you, when you exclude those things. You abstain from those things in your life. And, um, and so it's gonna, it, you'll see where it explains the, the, what foods you should eat and what food, foods you should avoid. So I want to start by going to Daniel, the 10th chapter. If I didn't tell you that website, it's wearejoy.church. You should know that by now. Some of you probably are hearing this for the first time, but it's wearejoy.church slash forward slash fast. Pretty simple. Daniel, the 10th chapter, the first verse, says there in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar. And the word was true. And it was a great conflict. And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. So God, God gave to Daniel the, the gift of, of interpreting dreams. Um, and also he gave Daniel visions of what would come, what would, would uh, of the future. And so we see here, it says here that Daniel understood the word and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks, for 21 days. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full, how many weeks? Three. For three weeks, for 21 days. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. So, so what Daniel is looking at right now is an angel. He's looking at the, the angel Gabriel, who was, who was sent by God to, give, uh, to deliver a message to Daniel. And so he sees this man standing afar off. And then he goes to explain, but I want us to, to, to skip over to verse 10. And it says there, and behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and my knees. So he was literally shaking in his boots. He was terrified. <laughs> there was an angel standing before him. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. Stand to your feet. For now I have been sent to you. So he didn't just show up because he wanted to. God sent the angel Gabriel on an assignment to do something specific, and it was to send and to deliver a message to Daniel. And when he had spoken this word to me, 
I stood up, still trembling. He couldn't stop shaking. You ever done it before? <laughs> Sometimes your knee will start quivering. You're like, man, stop. Or you'll raise your hand. You didn't even know you were shaking. You're just like, what's going on? This was happening to Daniel. And then he said to me, fear not, Daniel. For from the first day, someone say the first day. This is huge and this is important. From the first day that you set your heart to understand. From the very first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself. You sacrificed yourself. You abstained from, from meats and sweets. You humbled yourself before your God. Not just because, but you did before your God. Your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. Oh, I have come. When I, when I read this this past week, it hit me different than it's ever hit me before in my life. Because sometimes we can get to a, a situation in our life or even a season of our life where we think, well, God's got that covered, so why should I even pray? Or maybe you have a child who, who is lost, who is just out on the streets struggling. And you think to yourself, well, God's got it under control, so why should I even pray? Why should I do anything? Because if God's got it under control, but look at what, what the angel says to Daniel, I have come because of your words. And I felt like that was a spiritual butt kicking for me, like, whoa, wake, wake up, Brandon. Don't relax. <laughs> don't don't, don't uh, let the, the enemy lie to you and think that you don't need to communicate with your God. Amen. He desires a relationship with you. And I want to kind of, in that 12th verse, I want to back up a little bit. Because the angel tells Daniel from the, from the very first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard. And sometimes after the first day of talking to God, we'll, we'll give up. So he didn't answer my prayer, so I guess, I guess it's God's will. But in, in a moment here, we're going to see where the angel Gabriel, he's going to tell Daniel, he's going to give him some insight because he actually was on his way 21 days pre prior. He was on his way, but he got stopped and he got hindered in Persia with the spiritual battle, with the spiritual hindrance, where the angel of the Lord was sent, but the, the angel of darkness, the, the demons, were set out to stop Gabriel from sending that message. Now, I want you to realize something here, that God is not hindered. God himself is not in a battle. God... If God wants to, he can just give someone the finger and just flick them or flick it, whatever it is, and it'd be obliterated. It'd be wiped off the map. He can speak it. He can think it. And whatever it is, it's obliterated because that's what he wants. So to realize that God is not hindered. But we, we learn and we know in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, that there is a battle raging and warring in the heavenlies. That there's a battle between light and darkness. There's a, there's a battle between the angels of God and the demons of the devil. And there's a, there's a, there's a war going on. And we see here in that 13th verse, he, the angel says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. There was a war. There was a battle going on that he couldn't, that Daniel couldn't see. And I want you to know that there's a battle going on in the heavenlies that you cannot see. And I, I kind of want to give you some insight. This is off script here. There are some things that, that you will tell me or people will tell me that they're struggling with. And I'll hear from you. And then it's funny, not haha -ha funny, but ironic, not a coincidence, how someone else who isn't even part of that situation will come to me and tell me something 
that is super similar to what the person over here just told me. And then another person will come tell me that they're struggling. They had no idea that these people had told me anything, but that there's something going on in their life that lines up with what's going on. And it, it's a trick of the enemy. That there's a battle raging. And the, the thing is that the devil doesn't have to use different tricks with different people. He can use the same trick that he uses with you, that he uses with you, that he uses with you, and he does. And so when you're going through your situation and the way you're looking at it, it's like this in your face. And that's all you can see. But when I have people coming to me, telling me, coming to me for counsel, and I'm able to, to zoom out of the situation, I'm seeing that there's a fire going on over here and a fire going on over here and a fire over there. And I'm like, devil, you dirty rascal. And he's doing something undercover. That's why the word of God tells us not to be weary in well-doing. Because he heard you on day one. God heard you on day one. Can I say it again? God heard you the first day you called out to him. And to keep on praying, whether it's your situation or, it's, or maybe it's a family member or it's, it's in your finances or in your marriage or whatever it is. Don't get tired of doing what is right because not if there's a battle, but because there's a battle raging, continue to pray for your brothers and your sisters in Christ. Continue to pray for your unsaved loved ones because there's a battle going on and the angel of the Lord, he gives Daniel and us today some insight into what's actually going on. That he says, the, the, the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But Michael, who was the warring angel, Gabriel, when you see Gabriel on the scene, he's going to deliver a message. When you see Michael, someone's going to get their butt kicked. <laughs> and so he says, Michael came, one of the chief princes came to help me. For I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. And so we see here that the, the angel of the Lord was sent 21 days prior. Right. But he says in that 12th verse, let me go back there. I, mean, I, 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 want, I want you to get this. He says, from the, from the very first day that you, you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself, you took a physical action. He says, before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. So don't lose faith. Don't give up. Continue to hold on. God isn't distant. He's here. He, he, he's a very present help in time of trouble. He, he, he is. He doesn't know how not to. <laughs> And so we see here that, that because Daniel fasted and prayed, because he sacrificed and humbled himself before God, that the hand of God moved in his favor. A physical action produced a heavenly response. Not that you're able to manipulate the hand of God. But that by faith, when you, when you step out by faith, because realize that faith is an action word. Someone who has faith isn't a spiritual couch potato. But someone who has faith will step out, will trust God in their situation. Even if it doesn't look like the next step is there, if God says it, hey, I'm gonna step out knowing that God is my rock, that God is my foundation. That, that he is going to, to show up when I desperately need it. Amen. If you're taking notes, you might want to write this down. You cannot buy God's favor, but you do not get more of God's favor without sacrifice and surrender. 
You cannot buy God's favor, but you do not get more of God's favor without sacrifice and surrender. You see, there's a difference between God's love and God's favor, and I, th I think sometimes we, we mix the two. You see, God will never love you any more or any less than he loves you right now. You can't earn his love. You'll never deserve his love, yet his love for you is freely given, and it, and it comes without condition. It's an agape love. It's, it's, a, it's a love that comes from God. It's a perfect love. It's a love that's able to love when it's least expected and least deserved. You see, God loves you and he gave his life for you even before you were able to express your love to him. The word of God tells us that before or while we were still sinners, God sent his son to die for us, to take our place. There's no love that, that, that exceeds that, that supersedes that. That's the greatest love that you can ever come into alignment with, to be a part of. And now, now God's favor is something completely different. God's favor will enter a person's life at the moment of salvation. When a person puts their faith and their trust in Jesus, God's favor now rests on them. You've got the Holy Spirit living on the inside. But just like in Daniel's situation, in order to get increased favor... Many times there must be a physical action that takes place. Am I saved? Yes. Am I forgiven? Yes. Am I in eternally secure? Yes. But in order to get a response from heaven for my situation, many times I will have to take a physical action. And I think this, is, I think this has been lost in translation somewhere, somehow. We've become more of a consumer church where we think that God owes us. That God owes me and I should be able to just sit down and, and God comes to me when a, in, like, like a waiter would. But it's not like that. And sometimes if I need, if I, if I need a response from heaven in my life, many times I'll need to take a physical action I'll need to step out by faith in order to, to trigger a response from heaven. Some of you looked at me funny when I said that. And I think it has a lot to do with, with the modern church. If a church doesn't have enough lights, I'm going to go find the church with lights. If the church doesn't have a drum set, <laughs> I want to go find a church that plays the drums. I'm going to go find a church that meets my needs. That's so dangerous. Because we're finding that that's not just in the church, but it's also in relationships. If she doesn't meet my needs or if it doesn't work out the way I wanted it to, because I'm a consumer, then I'm a split. Or if he doesn't turn out the way that I thought he should turn out, I'm out of here. And it's dangerous because it's a part of our culture. It's not just a church thing. It's, it's a cultural thing, right? Yes. Many years ago, I, I prayed that, that God would deliver me from a few addictions that I had in my life. Three, three to be specific. And I was praying for years. God, take this from me. Like it would benefit you, right? If you took these addictions from me, this would totally benefit you. Like turning it around on him. That's what we do. And it didn't happen. And I, I was asking God, like, God, why? Like, I'd be on my knees in prayer. God, why, why aren't you taking these addictions from me? Why aren't you taking these addictions from me, God? Like, I, I, I don't want them anymore. And they're kind of screwing with my life. They're messing with me. And he gave me, he gave me a, a secret. He gave me a nugget. He, he, and it goes along with what I've been talking about this morning. I had to take a physical action in order for me to get my healing and my deliverance. He told me that you've got to go to your dad. It, and it wasn't an audible voice. It was something that I knew in my heart that I needed to do. <laughs> and so 
I went to my dad, who was also my pastor, and I, I told him everything. Knowing that it could be totally over for me, he's gonna kick me out of the house, um, he's gonna make me have to do some things that, like in front of the church that are embarrassing, and, because that's where my mind went. And the moment that I, that, I, that I confessed my faults and my sin to my dad, because realize I confessed them to God already, but God told me, he said, you can confess to me all day, but you're still running around in secret doing the same things that you were praying to me to try to get out of your life. It wasn't until I became accountable to a human being in my life that moment I was delivered and I was healed from all three. Something I'd been praying for for years. It wasn't until I took the physical action. And it may be different for you. Whatever that physical action is going to be. As we respond to God, we see that, that heaven responds to us. And, I'm, and this is not 100% of the time. This is a situation that you're struggling with that just won't go away. It's like that fly that won't, like it's like keeps flying around your face and it's not going anywhere. It's like the sticky one. You do like that and it's like, end, ends up on, on this cheek. And so there are certain situations that we run into in our lives where we will need to take a physical action in order to receive a response from heaven. And that, you just heard my story of how it happened in my life. And there's so much that, oh my goodness, like, there's so much I want to share with you about fasting. And it's, 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 uh, there's just so much, so much here. And I'm going to, I have to, to uh, shrink it down and maybe we'll come back to it um, in, in the future about fasting. So don't think that this is like a, a total comprehensive, full laid out of fasting. I'm giving you what I can this morning. Matthew, the 17th chapter, the 14th verse, we, it's also in, in Mark, uh, the same story. Um, in the book of Mark, you get a little more detail. But we see here in the 17th chapter of Matthew, when, when they reached the crowd, a man approached and knelt before him, before Jesus. And he says, Lord, he said, have mercy on my son, because he has seizures and suffers severely. He often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. And Jesus re replied, you unbelieving and rebellious generation, how long will I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. From that moment, the boy was what? Healed. The boy was healed. Then the disciples, later on, they approached Jesus privately and said, why couldn't we drive it out? And then Jesus responded, because of your little faith. Or in other words, because of your lack of faith. And he told them, for I, for I assure you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, if you have the faith the size of a grain, you will tell this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Amen. Nothing will be impossible for you. However, someone say however. however. This kind does not come out except by prayer and fasting. You see, there are some things in our life that will not budge without a physical action. Without a physical sacrifice on our part. Many times, we'll be so connected to the world that we don't even realize it. Our lives will be so interwoven into the things, the thoughts, and the ideas of this world that we don't even see it. Then we'll go to God, we'll ask Him to intervene in a certain situation, and it'll seem like God doesn't hear us. Like God is nowhere to be found. And I want you to know that it's not that he can't hear you. Remember, he hears you on day one. But maybe it's because he's not willing to give you something that you're not prepared to receive. You see, prayer is us connecting with God. It's us aligning ourselves with God's will. It has nothing to do with manipulation or manipulating the hand of God because realize that God will never do anything outside of his own will. Will not. Now fasting is us disconnecting with the world. 
It's us taking charge over our own physical body and saying no to our hunger and telling our cravings to take a back seat. So that when we pray, or so when we pray, we're aligning our ways with God's ways. And when we fast, we're preparing ourselves and making room for whatever it is that God is wanting to do. Isaiah 58, 5. We're landing the plane here. God was speaking through the prophet Isaiah, and he says this, talking about concerning fasting, because the, 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 the Israelites, those, they, they would fast, but it was only an, an external thing. It was a show kind of a thing, and they would, when they were fasting, you knew they were, because they were they were, they were clothed in sackcloth. They were sitting in ashes. They, everywhere they went, they would hang their head. And so it became an external thing. Did nothing to do for their soul and did nothing to do for their heart. It did nothing to do for what their, their situation was. Just made them look, in quotes, good to the people who could see them. And so God, through the prophet Isaiah, he asked this question, is such the fast that I, chose, that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it, to, is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Then he says, in that sixth verse, he says, Is not this the fast that I choose? To lose the bonds of wickedness. To undo the straps of the yokes, of the yoke. To let the oppressed go free. And to break every yoke you see a true fast that God has chosen isn't about the external and putting on a show but a true fast first of all is about bringing honor and glory to God not because he needs it but because he deserves it Amen. you see he is worthy of all praise he is God. He is king of all kings. He is wonderful and he is Lord. Amen. A true fast that God has chosen secondly is about the humbling and the lowering of our will to God's will. He must increase and I must decrease. So a true fast will result in the reforming and the realigning of our lives. It will result in the undoing of the wrongs in our life. It will loose the bonds of wickedness and will crush the things that don't belong that are just weighing down the life of a believer. Can I hear an amen? amen. You didn't know you had this weapon, did you? And I believe a lot of believers have been walking around with this weapon, the weapon of prayer coupled with fasting. We put it up in our closet because we, we think of it as being too hard, not realizing it's a weapon that we have access to, that we are, we are, we are coming into alignment with God, the God of, of creation, the God of the, of the heavens and the earth. Not that we have power in ourselves because with, separated from God, we're nothing. We're less than that. But God plus nothing equals everything, right? So as we humble ourselves, as we fast, as we must, we, we've got to be careful not to put our will and our expectations before God or before His will and His expectation, because that's what we'll do many times. We'll, have it, we'll go into the fast or we'll go into prayer with a certain and specific expectation and when it's not met, we'll think, God, surely that wasn't. Surely God didn't hear me, or surely that, that wasn't God's will. And so we've got to be careful to not put our, our will and our expectation before God's. I believe that we should come to God with our needs and our desires, but with the understanding that if it doesn't happen or turn out the way that, he had, that we had hoped, to realize that God is still in control, that God still knows the end from the beginning. He knows better than me, 
And ultimately, it's not about me, but it's about him. And so as we go into this fast as a church, I want us to go in with a, with a, with a right spirit, with a right attitude. And whatever you're going to be fasting about, I want you to, for this next week, I want you to be praying about what, what, what God wants you to fast for. What is it? What's God's will? What's God's desire? What's his purpose for your life? And what that's gonna, what that is gonna take, it's gonna take some change that happens on the inside. A lot of times we want this to change, but God is like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip the fluff and I'm gonna go right to the source that is causing all of this. I'm gonna go on the inside and I'm gonna do some rearranging and as we fast, what we're doing, we're preparing ourselves for what God is wanting to do on the inside. First, right there where you are, would you just bow your head and close your eyes? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word, for your truth, for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the example you've shown us in uh, Daniel's life where you sent your angel, your creation, Gabriel, to send a message and gave him and us some insight of to what's actually going on in the heavenlies, that there is a war going on. And just because it doesn't look the way we want it to look, for us to keep, continue to hold on, to realize that there's a war and maybe there's going to be a, a physical action that takes place on my part that you lead me to do in my life. Lord, I pray for your people. I pray for your church. That in this fast, you will, you will lead us. You will guide us, direct us, give us direction. Give us a vision for your kingdom, for your purpose, for your will. And whatever needs to be changed and rearranged on the inside, Lord, give us the courage to allow you to do that. And right there where you are, we'll just take the next couple moments. Just with your own words, your own lips, your own heart, your own mind. Just talk to God. We thank you, Lord.